Let me just click start recording there, so you'll be able to get to this after the fact. Um, so all of these calls are monthly, so the next call will be July 3rd, as uh, Danny just mentioned. Um, what I want to do before we jump into um, today's presenters is just do a quick um, introduction of who's contributing to this call. So I'll start this call by just kind of giving anyone that's not familiar with the Microsoft Graph a bit of an introduction to the Microsoft Graph and where they can go to get resources. And we have three really good presenters, uh, one from Microsoft, Casey Burke, who's going to talk about Power Apps. And then John Lou's going to actually talk about Microsoft Flow. And uh, Vincent Barret is actually going to talk about a solution they've built for a customer leveraging the Microsoft Graph. So hopefully with these three solutions, you get a good understanding about what is possible with a Microsoft Graph that you could then take back to your own organizations and try and build applications using the same kinds of technologies, or maybe it just inspires you to go dig a little bit deeper. So if I just kind of grab over in a browser and visit graph.microsoft.com here, on the landing page, we've made it super easy for you to navigate using this main navigation here. Now, I'm not going to go through all of this, but I wanted to just highlight three main areas. The first is the Graph Explorer. As you see these presentations go through, um, they'll be talking about a lot of the endpoints that they're using in their solutions. Um, a nice part about this Graph Explorer is, is that it's very much like Postman, where we can see the API endpoint, we can pick the method and run this query. And so you can see here that when I'm running the queries for uh, me, I'm getting these sample data here where it show me things like the fact that I can get at the office location for Megan Brown and I can get the mail address of Megan Brown just by making this call to the API um, on the V1 production. I can also change that to the beta endpoint. So there's a few things in these presentations where we'll talk a little bit about um, things that haven't quite made it to V1 yet. And again, you can experiment here with this. If you sign in here, you'll actually see more additional um, samples and we allow you to go and plug and connect into all the different services that under the hood go to the Microsoft Graph. The whole concept of the graph is is that with one authentication flow using one of our SDKs or using kind of the rest endpoints directly, you can get at all these different services to, for instance, have a solution that maybe pulls user information and gets things like the user photo, but then also has the ability then to kind of save some files to OneDrive and maybe even send a mail using that person who's signed into the graph for you. So simple things like get my photo here will actually go and respond with a preview and allow you to see the headers that it's returned as part of that call using the v one me slash photo dollar value, which is basically getting back that binary. So this is a great playground for you to kind of get an experiment and understand what's available on the graph.microsoft.com. And then from a quick start perspective, Inside of the quick starts, if you're building, for instance, an iOS Swift or an iOS Objective-C app, or maybe you're an enterprise developer who lives in Visual Studio, we actually have these flows here that will actually walk you through and handhold you to getting an application secret and then downloading a Visual Studio project that you can kind of F5 and run on your local development machine and get started straight away with the SDKs to call those graphs. So if you want to kind of move from kind of playing in a browser to playing on your development machine, these quick starts are the best way to do that. And then ultimately, from a samples and SDKs here, for each of the different platforms, we have samples, and these, this list is growing. If you have any you would like to contribute, please reach out to us um, through the channels we'll provide at the end of this presentation. Um, we're always looking for people that have built on top of the REST APIs or have used our SDKs to build certain solutions. So um, definitely the best way to start there with the graph.microsoft.com. And then one last thing before I hand off to Casey. Um, from a build recap, in the blog post we'll post in the tech community um, straight off this call with a recording, um, there will be all these links for these sessions. But if you did miss build, all of these sessions are available on demand to view um, through Channel 9. And you can see here I've kind of picked a few of the, the key ones that you should go and look at. Um, Yina's keynote session um, was a really good kind of overall kind of messaging of what you can do in the graph and what we see as the future of the graph. Um, and then Yina did a whole deep dive into uh, the Microsoft Graph with some really great demos. So if you haven't seen that session, I'd highly encourage you to go and see all those demos. And in addition to that, um, 
the one of the demos that she demoed in the session is already available on GitHub for you to pull down. And we're going to get Jason Johnson, who actually wrote that sample, um, to come on one of these calls in the future. He was in a dentist chair at the moment, so he couldn't make this call. Um, but we'll get him on a call later to kind of demonstrate in more detail um, what's happening there. And again, all these links will be in the blog post that's coming through. So for our first focus topic, I wanted to hand over to Casey Burke, who's going to talk a little bit about um, the Power Apps and Microsoft Graph. So Casey, if I just kind of hand the baton to you, I think I believe you're already a presenter. All right, let me see if I can take control here. And thanks for the introduction, Jeremy. You're welcome. OK, you should have control there now. All right, so today I wanted to introduce some of our Power Apps templates that we're using. Uh, we started an initiative about a year ago, I guess, and we built 10 different sample templates that leverage Microsoft Graph through Power Apps and the connector framework that we have. Uh, so a little bit about me, my background is mostly in Dynamics 365, been working with uh, CRM Dynamics 365 for about six years now and recently came to the Power Apps team and started this initiative with the Power Apps templates. And as we are kind of changing focus with the business application platform and saying that Power Apps is now the customization experience across Dynamics 365. So I'm working both on the model driven side as we're calling it now, building Dynamics 365 applications, uh, working on the new designers for the low code platform, being able to customize Dynamics 365 as well as the Power Apps Canvas apps. So a little bit of a quick overview before we get into the demo here. So if we look at the business applications platform, at its core, we have Power Apps and Power BI. So looking at building apps with transactional type of data, and then on the right side with Power BI, being able to visualize that data. So as we carry this out a little bit further, we have the common data service for apps on the left side with Microsoft Flow that allows us to automate those business processes. On the right side, we have the common data service for analytics, once again, that analytical data. And then we have this rich set of data connectors that actually over 200 of them that allows us to pull in data from multiple different sources and not just Microsoft sources. And then this is all combined with the power of Azure that allows us to extend this functionality. So some of the core capabilities that we have are building applications. So building these Canvas, uh, these Canvas apps, you can build model-driven apps. We have wor really rich workflow engines that allow us to automate these processes through Flow and as well as within Dynamics 365. And then we have over 200 different data connectors that allow you to pull in data and perform CRUD operations across multiple different sources. And then we take this no cliffs approach. And so we realize that we don't have a connector for everything. And so this is where developers can come in and they can build RESTful APIs as custom connectors through ASP.NET Core or through Azure Functions. And then we can use that in Power Apps through the Swagger API definition. So all this allows you to go from SaaS to IaaS. So we have these 10 new Office templates. You can find these at web.powerapps.com. And then there's a tab to click on Office. And we filter down, you can see all these different templates that we built. So today I'm going to give you a demo of our Meeting Capture app. I'm going to start out with a functional overview so you can see what the app does, and then we'll dive into the code a little bit and break it down. So let me see here. I might need to start presenting my screen now to have this browser up and take over. Jeremy, let me know if you have that. It is still loading. There you go. I can see your screen now. That's awesome. OK, great. So like I said, go to web.powerapps.com. On the home page here, you can see all our sample apps that we have. And then if we 
click on the office filter here, you can see the ones specific that we uh, built that leverage the, the graph APIs through our connectors. So to get this specific app, you can click on it, and for any of these, really, you can click on them, and it gives you a preview so you can see what the actual app does. Allow access to the connectors that it uses, and then if you click Make This App, it's actually going to create a copy in your environment so you can start working with it, and you can start customizing it from there. So I actually already have this one opened in edit mode. So we launch into the Power App Studio here, and then in the studio, you have the ability to both play the app so you can run it in real time, and you can back out of that and start ed making edits. So let's go ahead and play this app here. And this is my demo tenant that I set up. And so I'm going to click on this meeting here, which is the one we're currently in. You can see it's a filtered list, uh, basically sorted in the order of how your day is going to progress and uh, the meetings that you have in your calendar. Start this meeting. It gives you a little pop-up just letting you know to click finish and save or you're going to lose your data. So go ahead and accept that. On the left side, it's bringing in the list of meeting attendees here. I have the option to email all these attendees, or I can just email a single person. We can take notes, and we can also add tasks that will then go to Planner. So let's create a follow-up task. And then we can choose, so anyone that's already on the meeting is pre-populated, and we can also search for users in our org. So let's just choose an existing person. Go ahead and save this task. Let's type a couple notes here. And then finish and save. And you can see here, this gives us the option to export everything that we've just captured in our meeting to multiple different sources. So we have some notes for the meeting. Let's go ahead and select the notebook where we want those to be stored. Let's go ahead and select the office planner location, put it in this to-do bucket, and then we can also add additional people here if we want to send meeting notes to them as well. So let's go ahead and click on export. We're finished taking notes. Okay, and then it lets us know that the export is complete. So you can come into here. So this is my outbox. And you can see it got sent from my email address. So we use this nice HTML email template. It gives all the details about the meeting, who the attendees were, uh, the meeting details, all the notes that you took, and then any tasks that were created from that meeting. And this is actually a deep link to Planner as well. And I have that open in another tab. And so if we come in here, I believe I created it on this one. You can see here, this is that task that I just created right here in Planner. So if we jump back here, what I'm going to dive into is the schedule a follow-up meeting. So we're going to look at finding available meeting times if we want to schedule this follow-up. And so, like I mentioned, you can toggle in between playing and running the app versus um, editing the app. So if I click the X button here, this brings us back into the studio, and we can start making edits. And so let's actually get to the next screen here. So I have the option to add additional people for this follow-up meeting if I want, and I can add an additional message on top of it if I want to. All right, so here we have the date for the follow-up meeting, and then the time range for when we want to look at, uh, at a follow-up meeting for, and then also the duration. Okay, so let's go back into the studio and take a look at what this function is doing. So I'm going to go ahead and expand this. OK, so the first thing that we're doing here is, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Power Apps, the clear collect function here is going to create an uh, internal collection within the app, so internal storage of this data. Um, the clear portion of the function, so clear collect, means that if the, uh, if the collection already exists, we're going to clear out any data that might already exist in the collection. We're going to populate it with the new data. 
So you can see here, collection function here is taking these properties. Um, we're going to set the, we're going to call the collection meeting times, and then we're going to add columns to this collection. So Office 360, what we're doing here now is we're using the Office 365 connector and we're calling the find meeting times function. So if you can look over here, if we do view data sources, one second here, let me close this. You can see this Office 365 here. So we're always going to use the name as you see it in this list for the connector that we're calling. So we're calling the Office 365 connector, which in turn is using Graph APIs behind the scenes. Okay, so mm -hmm. if you look here, if you look here, it tells you, is there a question on the call? No, I think feedback. someone was just unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So if you, if you, when we click inside the um, the function here, it gives you all the parameters that are required for this specific function. So for the Office 365 find meeting times, and then these are the properties that we're gonna, or these are the parameters we're gonna pass. So um, maximum candidates, we're gonna pass uh, 15. is the maximum number. Um, minimum attendee percentage, zero. And then the meeting duration here. So um, you can see how it's highlighted on the screen. See how this is kind of a purple color? And so it's actually getting that from the meeting duration uh, pick list right here. And you can see how all these were actually highlighted in a different color, and that's represented in your function, how these become highlighted here. So that's where it's actually getting the data from. Okay, so then we're starting, we're setting the start and end time. We're gonna pass that into this function and we are converting that to uh, UTC and minutes. And then we're going to convert that to text as well because that's the input that this function takes. And then for the required attendees one here. So what we're actually doing with this one is we had created a collection on the previous screen. And so we're gonna look up to that collection, get all the users that are listed in the collection. So this was basically when we selected all the users that we wanna schedule the follow-up meeting time for. And then we're gonna concatenate that list with a semicolon. So if I go here to view collections, we've already run this code. And let me just see, it was called the follow-up meeting attendees, so. So you can see here that this collection is already populated with data. Okay, so we're gonna get all that data back from the connector um, as well as with the start and the end time for the meeting. And we're gonna store that in, the, uh, in this meeting times collection. So once again, if I go back here, look at that meeting times collection that we've just created. Looks like I need to run it again. I'm probably turned out, but um, basically all this data is going to be populated within that collection. So let me play this, and we'll do find available meeting times. And now it's returning all the available meeting times for these people. And I don't have the uh, kind of sample data set up for it, but you can also see um, in the list here, you'll see that maybe certain time slots will have 65% available uh, availability for the, the different people that were in that meeting. And then we go ahead and sort this based on the availability and the time. So if we go back here, 
and we can click on this available times gallery. So this is where we're actually binding the data. And so I can go ahead and edit that. Oops, let's go back and edit this. And we'll look over here. So this is that collection that we just created, meeting times. Um, it says blank for the layout just because we haven't specified any one of the out-of-the-box layouts that you can uh, present the data with. And then we're setting a few properties here for this collection as far as we're using a string here to say the availability and then we're using that um, confidence score that actually got stored in our collection. And then we also have the sort order here. So we're sorting it by the confidence um, in ascending, or, or sorry, in descending order, and then by the start time in ascending order. So that's just kind of a subset of the functionality of the app. I wanted to do a deep dive into the formulas. Um, what's really cool about these is you can build an app in a couple of days, sometimes a couple of weeks for the more complex ones. This is actually one of my favorite apps. It has a lot of different functionality in there. We use a variety of different data sources um, that use different graph endpoints. And so I'd encourage everyone to go through and uh, play with a couple of these apps and let us know what you think. It's, uh, it's really exciting how, how quickly you can build an app. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, on to the next presenter. Hey, Casey, we, have a, we, we do have a question um, before we move on. Um, mm -hmm. Will this be able to integrate into Teams to restrict candidates as well? Um, there was an answer that um, if you make a connection, you can add people to the collection before passing them to Outlook. Um, but mm -hmm. then <laughs> the next question was, what if your company has decided to discontinue using groups and has not implemented Teams? Uh, I don't believe it should be dependent on the groups of the Teams. So you should be able to just get the individual attendees with an email address. And you can see here if we hop over to Teams. And so I can actually add this meeting capture app directly in my Teams channel. And so we have the ability to add Power Apps in. So you can just do a search for this. Sorry, I've actually stolen your, um, I'm sharing the slides again, Casey. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, trying to. Gonna... <laughs> okay. I'm just going to show uh, there's an add-in for Teams as well, and so we can actually drop this app right in Teams, and you can use it from there. And so okay. can they download these templates and modify them, Casey, or are they kind of published apps that they can use without being able to modify them? Yeah, you can absolutely modify them. And so if you click Make This App from the Power Apps portal, it gives you your own copy of it in full edit mode, and so you can go in and tweak anything in the app you want. You own it at this point. That's great. Well, look, thank you very much. I'll just share the slide with the links that you guys can grab for the web powerapps.com and the, the documentation there on the various different connectors that are available. Um, it seems to be dr dropping off my PowerPoint deck for some reason in Skype. Um, so next up, we actually have John Liu, who's going to talk about Microsoft Flow. So John, do you want to try and more successfully share your uh, desktop to be able to show what you've been doing with the graph and Microsoft Flow. Hello, can you all hear me? Yeah, I can. That's great. It's good to have oh, you good. on, mate. It is 1 a.m. Um, <laughs> very excited. You're very excited. Um, you're you're fueled by Red Bull right now, right? Yeah, I'm wearing the Microsoft Graph um, jacket. It's winter in Australia. So that's good. That, that's good that you have clothes on on a conference call too. <laughs> um, I thought it's actually really appropriate to follow on KC um, and talk about. Is that me? Is that me? Oh. To follow on uh, KC and talk about flow. So, uh, following on from Power Apps. Um, this, I've given my side decks to Jeremy, so he will, he has this uh, as part of his slides. Um, the ones I have to show here are not branded, so they are very boring looking. Um, that wasn't the slide that I wanted to show to start with. So quickly, I want to go through a few slides and then uh, quickly get into the demos. I have quite a few. Um, 
But the magic of flow is that because they look like charts, uh, you can get through a lot of content very quickly. So uh, very quickly, I really love, uh, let me just hit present. Really love uh, both Microsoft Flow and Microsoft Graph. And to me, these are two, Microsoft's two cross product products. They help you link products together. Um, I work in Sydney as a SharePoint consultant. And I'm uh, around over the place in Australia, but I don't travel outside of Australia that often. So you should come to Australia and see me. Hey. Um, flow is lots of things. I won't really cover for that. I do want to give a quick shout out to the aad.portal.esri.com. Uh, too many times I see people say you should go to portal.esri.com. That's great, but that requires firstly a subscription. Uh, and then, you know, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Whereas uh, the Azure, the AAD team has a specific aad.portal.azure.com. It only shows the Azure AD stuff and it does not um, require an Azure subscription to access. So I just wanted to show that. Uh, quickly showing that also to do the demos I want to do today. People can't see my screen. Oh no! Uh, I I can see it, John. I think yeah, other can people can it. too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Cool. I it's not really moving. So next one. Um. So I quickly just want to show this screen where the demo set I want to do uh needs one application permission. So it's an app only permission that lets me read all the groups. That's the only. Uh, okay. Permission Sorry, John. It has frozen. Is it? Yeah, maybe if you cancel the share and reshare your screen. No, it's a movie. Uh, we can see your desktop with the browser behind your PowerPoint presentation. Oh, but you can't see my PowerPoint. I can see your PowerPoint. Okay. Well, let me just go into flow then. The rest. The rest of the slides are... Uh, oh, it's, it's refreshing about the, now. ...about the flows that I wanted to do. So let me just get rid of that. So um, I wanted to show three flows very quickly. The first one is a flow that will talk to uh, uh, Microsoft Graph to read the Office 365 groups that you have. And I know many people have done an example of this, but this is kind of a starting simple one that I wanted to show and then we'll get into something more interesting. Um, to store the results of what I read in this group, I create a SharePoint list. Can you guys see this, hopefully? Uh, basically, it has my group names, and it's got this group ID. That's pretty important. Uh, I ran it a while ago. Let me just make sure that it's still all working. Let me just delete a whole bunch of these. Okay, so I deleted the records of a whole bunch of groups. Uh, I go back here. And I just want to quickly show. So in Flow, uh, there is a connector called the HTTP connector. This is the best connector ever. Uh, it's like a switch knife into everything. So in the HTTP connector, you could set up Azure AD auth and basically fill it out like this. Let me just show this. So here I want to do a get request to Microsoft group, uh, sorry, graph uh, 1.0 slash groups. Use Azure AD. I need my tenant ID, a client ID, and the client secret. This is the app only permission. Um, that is the one connector you need to talk to Microsoft graph. You don't need anything else. So in one connector, you can talk to the graph and make a basic. Uh, it makes a HTTP call, but it does the authentication as part of this whole connector. It's really powerful. Um, that one's just a log. I wanted to see the length of number of groups that comes back. Um, pass is a very interesting uh, action. Um, if you if you play uh, a lot, if you as you get into flow. Um, you'll find it's both a, a good thing and a bad thing. Um, 
But in generally, generally the way we run pass is you will run this connector first. So build this flow, run it, and then get the output of this. Uh, sorry, I just saw a question. I'll get back to that. Um, the you take the output of this HTTP request, which will be a JSON array. You come, uh, you go back into edit. You hit this use sample payload, paste your JSON result in here. Then when you OK, it will generate this JSON schema. OK. Um, after you do pass with, and it creates a JSON schema, Flow is then able to interpret and give you uh, more intelligent like types. So yeah, and this, it's almost like before you do a pass with a schema, this is an untyped variable. It's just a JSON object. Whereas afterwards, it's like a type variable. It knows what properties are on the array and, and so on, whether they are strings or numbers and all, all that stuff. Okay, so that's usually what a pass is. Um, generally, just a caution, pass is generated from the first couple of rows in an array. So if you consider your JSON array and some of the fields are optional, maybe up the front, up the top, or they are uh, optional later, uh, the, JS the, the schema that it generates may think that a field is required. So sometimes you will get a pass error. Um, any way to define those for pass? Yeah, you can You can just edit this yourself. So say if you think this value is not always uh, you know, available, you could just get rid of this like that. That treats it like an ending kind of value, or you can use any as well. Anyway, let me um, go to the next part. Now, most examples I see with, uh, with flow, once you have a list of all your groups, what people do is we do this for each, right? We loop through each record in the graph output, and then we'll go and find the SharePoint item, check if it's there. If it's not there, we make a new one. If it's there, we do an update. That's usually how it works. I've tried to do it a different way, and it's actually slightly quicker. I just wanted to show. Uh, so firstly, I'm running a get item, so I'm getting all the items from a SharePoint list. Uh, there's no filter on it, so it's everything. Then I'm doing this thing with a select. Um, the select actions, uh, the select action in flow is like an array map. So if you're pro in, in programming concepts, it's an array map. It's a it's a projection. You could say from this uh, list of SharePoint items. I just want to select an array of all the group IDs. So what this confers is an array of list items into basically an array of group IDs. Okay, so this represents all the IDs of groups that I have already saved. And then this two filter array, these are basically array filters. You take all the JSON results, uh, and then you basically say if the ID of this for each of these, if the ID is in this array, sorry, if it's not in this array, then you put it into this set. And if it is in this array, you put it into this set. So you basically end up with two arrays of results. Yes, yes, I have an in um, Andrew Connor sample PR. But I pushed it up maybe yesterday, so maybe he hasn't seen it yet. But it's there, it's there. Okay. Uh, but basically, uh, this step afterwards, you basically end up with two arrays. One is a list of uh, groups from the Microsoft Graph that are not in your in your SharePoint list, and the other one is a list that's in your SharePoint list. And then I do two for each. Basically, one will create and one will update. So there's no uh, if condition check. This one just creates new ones, and this one just does updates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so let me just quickly run that. So that's calling the Microsoft Graph. And this is the output that I was talking about. So you will take this output and basically just paste it into pass, and it will generate that schema. 
Um, and what's there? So that's the array split. You see the both select and filter array are extremely fast. Um, they are really fast actions compared to something like for each, which is actually quite slow. Um, then for each new CC, I've created seven uh, SharePoint list items and I update the 19. Okay. Cool. And then if I come back to the SharePoint list, uh, you'll see all these are being updated. So in fact, all of them are being updated. These are really old groups that I've long deleted from um, my tenants. So they no longer get, get, get updated. All these ones got updated. Okay, a whole bunch of them are new. Uh, let me get rid of this. All these seven are new ones. Okay, all good. Um, still rushing through. How much time I have? Now, this flow takes 16 seconds, but I don't have that many groups. But um, there are a few ways to make it quicker. One is we could make this run in parallel. So let me just throw in a dummy action in here. I don't actually need this. Uh, you could just put that in parallel. Because your add new and your update, that could happen at the same time. There's not really any reason to run up one after another. Secondly, uh, these actions, they could all run. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, for each settings, concurrency. So they could actually run in parallel. Right, you don't need to wait for one to finish to add the next one. They can all be added at the same time. So, and so is the update as well. So let's do all that. If I hit that again. <laughs> I'm just running through my demo. Run, run, run. So it's already done. Um, because I'm running in parallel, the, oh, right, there's no more new records because they, they all exist. But because we're running, yes, someone's talking about throttling. <laughs> you can get into throttling, so please test in your environment. But one of the wonderful things about SharePoint connectors is this thing. See, retry policy is by default. So if your SharePoint connector gets throttled, retry policy will retry four times. Or you can use an exponential interval, so it will do like longer and longer retries. So I do test this against your policy, uh, sorry, against your environment. Uh, very cool, I like, I like some, you guys have done this. <laughs> okay, now uh, that's the first one. That one really is just to refresh the list. Uh, you see the second run is five seconds, okay? So you can refresh these things as often as you want. Um, Microsoft uh, Flow, you get 2,000 runs per Office 365 user. So you have thousands and thousands of runs. Uh, build one of these and don't worry about it ever again. Um, and then next part, next part is more fun. Next part is this one. I wanted to use uh, the HTTP again but I want to set up a subscription. Okay, so same, same again, connecting to Azure AD. Uh, but this time I want to set up a subscription. The subscription, I'm listening to the group's event. Sorry, the group's resource. And uh, I'm listening to the updated event, the change type. In Office 365 group's resource, the updated event includes new one as well. So that one I've been verified. Uh, I've asked the, the, the Microsoft Graph team. Uh, but the updated event shows you both new and updated you know, groups. Um, the, this particular resource expires in 4,230 minutes. So I just basically do a UTC plus 29. That's what, what, what that time is. So put that expiry time here, put the URL. So this is the actual webhook URL to call. And because this, this expires every three days uh, up the top, I just put a three day recurrence. So every three days, this will execute, resubscribe. I go to sleep. I don't actually worry about this flow. Okay, so this flow will resubscribe the webhook every three days. Um, this URL is actually the URL of another flow. So let me show you that. 
So this thing just runs every three days. I'm not actually going to run it because you can see I was playing around with it and I broke it. So then I have to fix it again. But in general, it runs every three days. It's been doing it since December. Um, I don't, personally, I don't know why it's three days. I think three months could be quite good. <laughs> anyway, one more. Uh, this is the group's listener. So the webhook URL points to this flow. Now, flows could be triggered from all kinds of triggers. This particular trigger is actually a HTTP trigger. So what this does is it creates basically uh, this flow is triggered with a URL. This is basically a web service. Um, then I'm looking for, so for a webhook to be set up, we need to listen and look for the validation token. So basically drop that into a, uh, try to find that. <laughs> three days is silly. But then you just re recurs every three days, so you don't worry about it. Um, so yeah, try to find the validation token. If we have a validation token, uh, to set up the webhook, we need to reply with the validation token with a text plan response. So just reply this. This will set up the webhook. If it's not a validation token, then we actually have an event. And I'm really cheating here. I'm not trying to listen to change or trying to find a delta. All I'm doing is calling my the first flow that I show that runs six seconds and just scan all my all my um on my flow again. And this one, we need to return a tool to accept the response, okay? Um, let me, so this is one that I tested earlier, but let me just quickly, I probably should do this well. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to do it here. Let's do it, uh, let's do it from here. Uh, quickly create a site, make another team site. Uh, Let's make that one the public one. Uh, and so, John, if people want to try these flows out, they can go to the GitHub repo where you've submitted the PR, which I'm assuming. Yes. Um, yeah, so there are three Andrew flows. Yeah. So there are three flows, but I've deleted all the client ID and client secret. So you'll need to go and go to your Azure AD tenant and create your own. Yeah. Um, so let me just finish that. Now I find that Microsoft Graph event for uh, groups is not instant. It's pretty good, but it's not instant. So let me just quickly come back to the listener. Oh, there we go. Four seconds ago, it's listen. So that, that new group that came through, it's called my other flow. And my other four probably finished by now. Hold on. So if I refresh this, you see it's finished. So this one's actually taken only four seconds. So if I come to my SharePoint list, you'll see the Microsoft Graph, which was made a second ago. Okay? So these three flows, they are set up and forget. You set them up and you don't worry about them. Uh, I guess your, your client secret could expire after some time, so you may have to refresh that eventually. But um, very simple ideas, uh, very quick to set up. Um, and I, I think there's a lot more to play with. Like we can do, um, yeah, there's, there's webhooks on users, there's webhooks on files, a whole bunch of new webhooks that we can use. Excellent. So really fun. Well, thanks very much, John. Uh, I appreciate you um, staying up so late to jump on this call. <laughs> Um, yeah. We do have Vincent as well to jump on to sorry, do another sorry. presentation as well. So okay. um, I've put the links in the blog post to the GitHub repo and your pull request um, with those Microsoft flows in it. So again, thanks very much for sharing that today. That's awesome. Okay. So um, we have 15 minutes left, which is perfect timing for Vincent. So yeah. Vincent Barry, um, appreciate you jumping on as well, mate. Um, I'll let you introduce yourself and jump straight in just uh, pro time purposes sure thanks very much uh, so you should be able to see my screen and hear yeah. me okay yeah. perfect 
All right, so my name is Vincent Bire. I'm an Office Servers and Services MVP. I also work as an Azure and Office 365 developer at Tutulead, a Canadian-based consulting company. And if you want to reach out to me, you can reach me out on Twitter, my blog, and other means. I'm going fast because I have a lot of content. Today we'll be talking about an application uh, which we built for our customers a couple of, uh, well, over the last year, actually. And to give you a bit of context, what it does, it's built for a, an international customer that has more than 100,000 users. And the need they had is, was to organize periodic online meetings. So they have this uh, legal requirement uh, of uh, having those meetings that happen every two weeks, every month, whatsoever, with both internal and external uh, users, and they need um, structured way to capture those meetings with the different topics of the agenda, the notes, the different tasks and outcomes uh, from the meetings, and also a place to collaborate on different files they might might need during the meeting. So this is the solution we built. Um, and as well, this meeting doesn't uh, uh, needs also to provide some teleconferencing and audio conferencing capabilities, uh, uh, and uh, as well as integrate with users' calendars so we can see reminders and have links and everything like that. So without further slides, let's jump into the demo. So let's suppose I'm a user in the company and I want to organize one of those new meetings. So I'm going to go to the provisioning portal of the company, create a SharePoint site because everything uh, uh, sits into SharePoint. And the first thing, I'm just going to refresh the page to make sure we didn't expire the cookies or anything like that. Uh, and the first thing I'm, I'm going to be prompted with is this uh, welcome wizard, which is going to say, hey, welcome. Uh, we created your uh, meeting workspace for you. But we need a few more details to make sure that it's set up properly. So uh, can you uh, uh, help us uh, set it up? So the first thing we're going to ask is uh, who do you want to, uh, to invite to, the, uh, to this meeting? Um, so I'm going to add a few uh, users here. Uh, the second set of questions we ask are more about the logistics, things like um, uh, the title of the meeting, the location, Demo, location on Mars. And let's say I want to organize it in uh, July uh, at, uh, let's say, 12 a.m. I know it's a bit early um, uh, for 30 minutes. But that's good. But let's suppose I don't know who's available at that time because I have external users and internal users. So what we also built is this scheduling assistant which relies on the uh, fine meeting time that uh, Casey uh, demonstrated with Power Apps earlier. So here we have a different view where we say, okay, uh, meeting um, at, uh, sorry, meeting admin E1 and meeting admin E3 are not available from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. because they are very busy people. So instead, uh, maybe you can organize it at 5 a.m. So you can select that, save, uh, save this, it's going to update uh, those fields. And then if you want to repeat your meeting, you can do, for example, the by weekly meeting on Mondays after and that will end after five occurrences. The next step is uh, do you want an audio conferencing for that meeting? That's going to talk to uh, Skype and once you've done that it's going actually to call our custom API and uh, create the SharePoint pages, create a few things in Exchange via the graph, as well as create the Skype online meeting. So that's deferred via a custom API, which relays that to our uh, web job that does all the creation for us and so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll wait for it to finish for a couple of seconds. And I'll look for the questions if there's any so far. No questions so far, good. So we'll let it finish, a couple of seconds. Thank you, uh, Tomislav. Uh, so yeah, after a couple of seconds, everything has been provisioned, so you'll see things loading. So we have our um, um, meeting workspace with one page for each instance of a meeting, each different date, with all our details uh, here. And if I want, I can join the audio call, which I'm not going to be doing because I'm demonstrating to you guys uh, right now. So how did we uh, build that so far? Um, you have to understand that most of the application sits in the um, uh, browsers, and unfortunately, the customer in that case is still using Internet Explorer. And the first thing we are going to do ever is to uh, always go talk to Azure Active Directory, which is going to hold all the identity requests, authentication and authorization requests for Office 365 at large, but also our custom uh, application and API. Once they do that, they get redirected to SharePoint, which serves the, via the Office 365 CDN, uh, the different files, 
and the different uh, um, assets that the application might need to run that runs into the browser. That application not only talks to SharePoint directly and Skype uh, for business as well as the Microsoft Graph, but also to our custom built API here that's uh, uh, an Azure web app with a web job, a service bus queue and a bunch of other things like that. And this in its turn talks back to SharePoint, Skype, the Graph and Azure Active Directory. If we zoom in on the um, authentication setup, we actually register two application registrations, one to reflect the user in his browser, and uh, when the app is loaded in the context, that's going to uh, ask for an ID token and a first access token via OpenID Connect and OAuth 2.0, and with that token, we'll be able to uh, either call the Microsoft Graph directly if we want to, for example, for the five meeting time I demonstrated earlier, or call our custom API. And What's that going to happen here is our custom API is going to send out this access token plus the ID, uh, its own ID and its own secret uh, for the second app registration. And uh, IAD is going to return an access token B, which we can use in its turn against SharePoint or the Microsoft Graph to represent the user in the context of using our API. Um, and we're doing that because we're using the V1 endpoints. Uh, with the V2 comes the on behalf flow, so you could simplify a bit this flow with the on behalf flow instead. And then in this turn, the Microsoft Graph talks to the different workloads and makes sure that uh, uh, it gets the data and does the things you want to, uh, to do. Basically, on the front end, uh, uh, what we used is Hello.js to handle uh, the um, uh, authentication and authorization dance, as well as wrapping up around the services and, and, and providing the token. I'm going to explain later on why, as well as PNPJS to talk to SharePoint for SharePoint developers here on the call probably know already about that. And on the back end, uh, because we're using the SharePoint CSOM as well as the uh, Skype SDK, uh, and both are not compatible with ISP.NET Core, we had to use ISP.NET Web API plus OWIN, which means that we had to use, at the time, ADAL.NET for the authentication and authorization layer, as well as the graph.NET SDK, of course. Um, a few endpoints we're using in the graph, slash me to get the user's information, slash me, slash find meeting times that uh, Casey demonstrated earlier to get uh, availability for different actors, um, slash me, slash events to do uh, any credit operations on, around all the events in exchange and send out the invites and track their responses and so on and so forth, as well as uh, license details because uh, some of the users don't have access to SharePoint or they don't have access to Skype, so we don't want to start doing things into Skype or SharePoint on behalf of that user if they don't have the proper workload enabled, right? Uh, so that was uh, that came handy. As well as uh, slash users to get information about other users, uh, uh, not, not the current user, basically. And I'm going to demonstrate uh, a few uh, code items here. So let me first start with a front end piece here. So this is how you configure Hello.js. It's actually very simple and the reason why we use Hello.js is because it's a proper ES6 module, which is not the which was not the case at the time of uh, ALJS. Uh, um, and uh, it has a lot of community support and documentation, so it was easier for us. Uh, the, the, the way you set it up, so you give it the uh, different endpoints you want to talk to, and uh, the client ID, and uh, a few other parameters. And you can also give it uh, the uh, different um, uh, resource endpoint you want to query and, and talk to here. So here is the example for the graph. So here we're saying, okay, this is the resource we want. Those are the scopes we need, uh, the different uh, endpoints and so on and so forth. And I'm going to be querying me license details and me uh, find meeting times as well. And once you do that, you can, in the same service, in the same class, actually build um, uh, a service, a higher, uh, like a programmatic service that you can use later to uh, query against, uh, well, uh, your your application and so on and so forth. So here is an example of what Casey was doing, but in TypeScript on how to query five meeting time, we're giving the exact same parameters with the meeting duration, the candidates, and a few other things like that. And here is how we query uh, the different, uh, different things. So this is for the graph. Same exact thing for our API, although we have different endpoints and different custom things. 
And if I jump back uh, to the back end piece of things, here's how on, in a now in context you set up the authentication. So here, first thing you want to do is inject uh, Windows Azure uh, Directory Bearer uh, Authentication Service. Uh, this is going to validate that each and every API call comes with a bearer token and the person is actually authenticated against the right tenant and so on and so forth, right? But not only you want to do that, and because it's all broken by uh, Active Directory, Azure Active Directory in the back end, um, we have different things you can do on our application depending on the permissions and the groups you're a member of in SharePoint. Uh, so this way we have an integrated security layer, uh, single sign-on and a seamless experience for the user. So here we built a custom uh, for eyes attribute that's uh, checking against um, SharePoint, what group you belong to, and depending on that you will access to different uh, uh, actions in, in the application. So this is how we built that as well. If I jump back to the slides, and I know there are questions in the chat, I'll handle that at the end. So what lessons did we learn and, and, and what can we conclude on the application? Uh, first thing, uh, as was mentioned in Frontlink during uh, John's demo, uh, you have to plan for that from day one because, uh, well, if you don't, uh, when you hit production, you will have issues and those are, uh, that reverse engineering exercise is going to be much more costly than just planning for that from day one. And I had a uh, detailed slide for that, but we don't have time today to talk about that. Also, think about authentication and authorization from day one because this will dictate the different libraries you can use, the different flows you can use, the different contexts, the different uh, frameworks, and so on and so forth. So again, uh, if you find a blocker or a showstopper at the end of a project, that's going to induce a lot of retro engineering. Um, when you talk about any calendar workload, so scheduling meetings, finding meeting times, always include the preferred Outlook time zone header. This is going to set uh, the graph to understand and exchange to understand that, hey, uh, that user is interested about that time zone, and this is going to make a lot of things simpler for you as a developer. Uh, and recurrence uh, is not easy thing uh, to manage, so rely on the graph. And there is currently a bug in the uh, C Sharp SDK that's documented. So make sure you go check those out before uh, you know running into issues and wondering what's gonna what's uh, happening basically. Um, if we had to build a V2 starting today, we would probably uh, leverage SharePoint framework because there is a um, native AAD service and a native graph service that were not existing at the time, and Azure Functions because they are native integrations as well. Um, we would probably, if we could, use .NET Core because better integration, better documentation, and faster, and so on and so forth. We would also, as well, probably use AADv2 to leverage the Elm behalf flow to make things simpler to implement and to deploy. And uh, if I had a few requests for the Microsoft Graph team, if you guys could standardize the throttling information across workloads, uh, that would be nice, like to get the same exact information across the different workloads, as well as finding recurring meeting time would be nice. Let's say I want to uh, have a meeting with Paul and Jack every week. What's the best time of the day, but also uh, day of the week, uh, where they are most likely to be available on, on average, right? Because right now the fine meeting time is only a, a one occurrence thing or kind of request. Um, Skype APIs are uh, unreliable, and I know Microsoft is investing a lot on um, Microsoft Teams, but having some of the APIs surface, you have a graph and a couple of refresh policies and will be nice to make our life easier. And uh, yeah, as I was building the presentation, I could not find any cool logo for a Microsoft Graph, a small logo. How come we don't have that yet? And with that, I think I'm finished. So thank you very much for listening in it, and I'll go in the chat for, for the questions. That's awesome. Thank you, Vincent. I, I love the logo comment. We were literally just talking about that yesterday um, at Ina's desk. So um, <laughs> watch this space, I guess. Um, so I think there were quite a few questions and with the process of time, what I'm probably going to do is take those questions offline and then we'll put them into the blog post that we'll post around this community call because there was a few others on there technically um, that got covered too. Um, let me just share my screen very quickly to just wanted to cover one thing, um, which was a lot of questions around how we provide feedback on the Microsoft Graph. Um, there are obviously the user voice channels right now where you can pr ask for new features. Um, and I can't believe that Skype is bombing out on sharing my desktop like this, so you might have to just imagine the slides. Um, and if there are issues with samples, we encourage you to um, post those on GitHub as well on, under the issues for those particular samples. But one question I'd like some feedback on, and my Twitter handle is at jthake, is um, 
how would you like to provide feedback on the Microsoft Graph APIs? Um, obviously, if there's an issue with this SDK, like uh, Vincent's mentioned, um, we can do that via the GitHub repo where the SDK is hosted. But one of my first projects moving back to Microsoft is to kind of get a bit of an idea about how we should track API um, bugs and issues, uh, regardless of it being in the sample or the SDKs and so forth. So um, if you have any feedback on that, please uh, let me know at jthake or jeremy.thake at microsoft.com. Um, and again, we'll get those blog posts out there. I'm a, Apologies, Skype for Business is not playing nice this morning and allowing me to um, share my screen. But there, just very quickly, just to close the call, um, there were um, three really good contributions which will be in the blog post um, from MVP people. And one of them was um, Deluca Glanu actually had written a, a series of blog posts on the Microsoft Graph and um, adding custom data to those endpoints. So if you've been looking at the metadata of the API objects that you can kind of pull back from Microsoft Graph, his blog does a great job of just showing examples of how you can add additional um, custom data into those objects. Um, and then Vlad and Waldeck also had some posts around the CLI and the build sessions um, download script. So if you're trying to get all of the build sessions downloaded in one file swoop. Vlad has a very good blog post on that. Um, so again, apologies for the technical difficulties today. Um, we're hard on the hour, so uh, a big thank you for everyone that's attended. And again, the next call will be um, this time next month. Um, please f make sure you're following Office Dev Twitter handle and you know engaging in the community on the blog post that we'll, we'll post later on today with the recording. So thank you very much to all the contributors, John, Casey, and Vincent. They did a great job of showcasing what they've built on top of the graph. And if you're interested in being part of this meeting, please let us know. Um, we're always looking for new people to come on and show what they're building with the Microsoft Graph. So a big thank you to everyone who joined the call and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.